Hello and good evening. Welcome everyone. People are still coming in, but um, we start with this closing panel of the festival Frequencies Sharing Feminisms. The closing panel is titled um, a Talk on Feminist Speech and Action, What's Up? So what we are going to do in the next one and a half hours is to look back and to then uh, take a look uh, to the future. So what are we going to take with us from the festival and how can we take all of this and put it into action? My name is Johanna Keller. I will be moderating the session. Uh, a very warm welcome as well, again, to those here in the hall uh, at Pfefferberg in Berlin, but also to those joining us in the live stream uh, online. I have three panelists with me, Joel Hatem, Nikita Dawan and Faikura. Before introducing them to you and before starting with our discussion, um, I would like to thank those who were involved uh, in the organization of this festival, um, those who contributed to make all of this happen, what you now see on screen. Um, the last bit more than two days since Friday evening, a very rich program of um, talks, performances, music, workshops, um, etc. Um, we had partners for the Goethe Institute. There was ICI Berlin and Sophienseele. Thank you very much for contributing. Um, we have translators who make possible that everyone can follow, not only from German into English and vice versa, but also into German Sign Language. Thank you very much for facilitating. We have, of course, a lot of participants and contributors. Um, I will not na name them uh, one by one, but also uh, big thanks to all the people from the Goethe Institutes uh, abroad, all over the world who contributed to the program. Thanks to the technical team. Uh, thanks to everyone supporting here uh, at the premises. Um, and then we have the team of Veranstaltungsmanagement uh, at Goethe Institute Berlin. Um, I will mention them name by name because uh, you have contributed, contributed to make this happen. Julia Braun, Lotta Duden, Daniel Göpfert, Marie, Marie Golenia, Ibrahim Hotak, Melisane Lecomte, Alexandra Röhr, Victoria Ulrich. Thank you very much. And then the biggest applause maybe to the curating team, uh, Shoshana Liesmann, Bettina Bender, Sima Reinisch, and last but not least, Caroline Nüser, who put all of this together as the project lead uh, for this festival. Thank you very much. Thank you for following and thank you for being with us. And please engage. Um, so you will, of course, have the possibility to also ask questions in the end, um, not only here at Pfefferberg, but also in the live stream. So please feel free to add your comments and questions in the chat and we will try to get back to them uh, at the end of the talk. So, as I said, we have three panelists um, tonight. Um, I start with my neighbor here to the left, uh, Faye Kuda. You know all of them from events uh, during the festival. Um, so Faye yesterday presented a book, Movements and Moments, uh, with graphic novels on indigenous experiences. Um, and this is also, also what she does. Uh, she works as a writer, an editor, and publisher. She is the founder of Gantala Press um, in Metro Manila in the Philippines uh, and has herself uh, written four books of poetry. So thank you, Fai, very much for joining tonight. We then have Nikita Davan um, sitting in the middle. Uh, Nikita Davan holds the chair uh, in political theory and history of ideas at the Technical University in Dresden. Uh, this is now another step in a very long academic career with different institutions. Uh, throughout her work, she has focused on global justice, human rights, democracy, and decolonization. And you have very big achievements in gender studies and gender equality, uh, achievements that have also been, been acknowledged, among others, by the uh, Goethe, Leichter, Goethe Leichter Prize uh, that you got uh, in 2017. I will not start with the list of publications, but please 
look it up uh, because Nikita has written a lot to this topic. And to the right, we have Joel Hatem. Uh, Joel is a communication professional uh, working in queer and feminist knowledge production. Um, she was uh, today already on another panel on exactly this topic, feminist knowledge production. And I forgot to mention that Nikita actually led a workshop on uh, intersectionality. So for those who were in the other events. Um, Joel studied translation and journalism in Lebanon, and she is now the managing editor of GEM, uh, a platform, a multimedia platform that produces uh, knowledge on um, gender, sex, and sexuality in Arabic. Thank you very much for being with us. When we look back at the festival, you were here, you participated in different events. What was a thing that sticks to your mind? What is one comment that you would have? What was missing? Uh, what was particularly positive? Let us know and share. please share your thoughts on the festival, whoever wants to start. Um, I think it was, I mean, we're still in COVID times, but trying to get out of COVID times. So I think what was very exciting was just to be physically in a place such as this, to meet different people and to discuss all of the issues that we work on in our own context, but to get together and be able to talk about them. Um, I think for me, there's one thing that, because I work in communication, I'm always looking at ways of being able to communicate something, to say something about um, the issues that, or life, or <laughs> what we go through. Um, and I think for me, what I really, I think I will carry with me and, and try to practice more is, is, this is all a lived experience. I mean, sometimes we can see things as, they become sort of abstractions, they're words. Um, we don't see their effects like physically in, in what we live and what we go through. So for me is to relate it back to this is a lived experience and how through it being a lived experience, um, it can be channeled diff differently, it can be understood differently, and, and hopefully there's action that can be done towards fixing something that isn't going uh, right, something that's hurtful, something um, that's broken, um, that we need to fix, and um, especially for when it comes to like issues related to, to gender and, and sexuality, and, and you know, like broader like issues that would put under feminism, it's a way of also like communicating that. It's not an abstraction. It's something that we live, we experience. Um. Can I go next? So I'd like to, it's on. Um, I'd like to start with congratulating. Joanna, thank the organizers. I'd like to congratulate the organizers. I had certain um, discussions with Soshana, with Caroline, with others on the team. And um, I, I was quite, uh, I, I was of course looking forward to the festival, but I was also a little bit concerned because I thought that it was quite an ambitious task that they had undertaken and sometimes you can bite off more than you can chew. And uh, they proved me wrong, thankfully. Um, I think they put together a fabulous program. Um, and Berlin being Berlin, I don't know if you all are aware, there are three parallel other programs going on in Berlin, which have overlaps with many of the issues that are being addressed, um, have been addressed in the last couple of days and will be addressed later in the evening. So there's another, um, well, I don't I need to do marketing for the other events. So there are other events happening in Berlin. Um, and so there's stiff competition, you know. I mean, this is, we live in neoliberal times. We want to contest neoliberalism. But uh, even when it comes to radical politics, there is stiff competition. And uh, there was a great turnout. Um, whatever uh, um, spaces I entered, and not just the inter uh, intersectionality workshops, uh, but also other uh, events that I, uh, panels that I followed online and also in person, um, I had the feeling, and harmony is not always a good thing, but there was a very constructive atmosphere, there were disagreements, there were very strong disagreements, but at least my experience was there was a certain respect in the air, which um, is 
um, I think this is what we as feminists, and I'm interpolating a we in this room, um, hope for, uh, to build a post-imperialist world, to build a world where there is a sense of reciprocity. We have to be able to also listen to each other. And I had the feeling, and I'm happy to be, I mean, in, uh, in the Q&A, maybe you all have other experiences that you'd like to share, but this was my general impression that there was a constructive, respectful uh, way to engage with dissent, with differences, which I really appreciated. I could go on, but uh, that's it for now. Uh, for me, uh, I really enjoyed my uh, stay in, in Berlin uh, for the past two days, two or three days. So thank you also to uh, the organizers and Githy Institute for initiating our uh, project, Movements and Moments, the anthology of comic book, uh, comics, uh, comic graphic narratives on um, indigenous women activists around the world, well, from the global south mostly. <laughs> so um, thank you. And uh, but for just to maybe it would be great if um, uh, it would be great to have uh, involved um, more uh, organizations maybe or collectives, uh, just to be more in keeping with the um, communal. Uh, character of uh, an event like the Frequencies Conference no? um, and to maybe have a, a small art fair where um, collectives or art women artists can share their work or uh, where organizations can um, explain their causes more and solicit signatures you know for solidarity campaigns and other um, more uh, concrete um, actions forms of action so, but uh, in general, it's, uh, it's a really, it was a really beautiful event, uh, a great lived experience for me. And uh, thank you, thank you to the organizers again and to my, my colleagues here now in the, on stage. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this feedback and also for uh, making new suggestions, what could be done differently. Um, I will come back to this in a minute, also the solidarity in forming coalitions. But before that, I mean, you've all mentioned we go out afterwards, um, and of course the context is different. It's a neoliberal context that we live in. Um, on the opening night, and now again, and we feel it here as well, we hear about this feminist energy in the room. It is a respectful atmosphere. Um, it is, to some extent, also a certain safe, safe space to a certain degree, at least we hope so. Uh, for more or less like-minded people. So, but when we go out, of course, uh, it gets rougher. Um, it's a more difficult situation. You all work in different countries, also like national contexts. Um, so how can we bridge this gap of needing these safe spaces and of course creating them and coming together as a like-minded group, but then also keeping up the energy to work in a context that is hostile, um, that is patriarchal, that is neoliberal. So what are your uh, strategies on dealing with this? I mean, it's, um, it's a very challenging thing, right? Um, being here in such a space, it feels like it's a, it's a microcosmos and then you have, to face, you have to face the world, as you were saying, and it's a much fiercer world. Um, I guess for me, it's, it's recognizing that I can't do it on my own, that, um, I mean, uh, there's a limit to what I can achieve on my own, the individuality of it. It, it can be very helpful and it can do a lot, but somehow we end up going back to the collective and the groups and how the groups can go grow into movements and, and, and bigger critical masses that can sort of keep pushing for such spaces. Um, uh, it's a constant tug and pull. I think um, one thing that we can do is to always be mindful of wanting to do this and trying to go about doing it. Um, uh, and remembering that uh, we're not just doing it I mean, we're doing things for posterity. We're not doing it. We're doing it for now in a way because this is the context that we live in. Those are the times that we're living in. And we're building on the experiences and the histories of, of so many people before us. But it's also, 
we're thinking of what we're doing, what we're leaving for the generation that's coming next and, and how we can keep on creating those safe spaces in the middle of the structures that we face outside of controlled environments when it becomes less controlled and becomes more oppressive in that sense. Um, Um, I think in any um, like political task, um, it's important to prioritize education, um, whether it's uh, educating yourself and educate or sharing your knowledge with with others. So, um, as an as activists, no, for for activists, education can take many forms. Uh, it can uh, be educational discussions, uh, workshops, conferences, all of these things. But it can also mean um, integrating with communities, no, uh, speaking with the people, uh, learning from them directly. So, um, and it's also being open to um, uh, criticism and maybe uh, suggestions on how to improve, um, how to uh, have a b better perspective of things and understanding of things. So I think as long as we are <clears throat> open to that, to, to learn more, uh, and we, uh, we're open to, to improve ourselves and improve our, our work, um, and to share our work, that, that's also very important. We will stay motivated to, to just continue you know, working and uh, yeah, doing what we have to do. So, um, Joel and uh, Faye put it so well, I'm just going to add some footnotes to what they already said and reinforce the points they made. So there's this super inspiring talk given by Angela Davis called, How, How Does Change Happen? And in this talk, she talks about, um, she describes this experience that she had um, about um, segregated water fountains for whites and blacks. And uh, she turns to her mother and asks about them. And the mother says, that's the way things are, but that's not how they will always be. And I thought that was such a, um, uh, such a instructive moment of feminist utopias, that just because it is like that, it, it won't always be. And although it doesn't, the present doesn't, um, I mean, it doesn't give us hope or doesn't uh, give us reason to be optimistic. Uh, we need to. We need to be able to imagine other futures. The other point uh, Angela Davis makes in this talk, which I personally find uh, extremely important, and it actually has been mentioned by both of y'all, so I'm really adding footnotes to what y'all said, um, that uh, when we are talking about uh, post-imperialist futures, when we are talking about feminist utopias, it cannot, we have to be very careful of the danger of vanguardism, of celebrating you know, particular charismatic figures, because this has to be a collective process. This cannot be individualized. And of course, we need role models. We need people who inspire us and who, um, you know, kind of also give us orientation. And yet, it has to be a collective process of thinking and uh, acting together. And my last point, and this is something for me more than for anybody else, is this wonderful quote by Terry Eagleton. He says, the problem um, um, is, uh, I mean, with a lot of political uh, projects is that uh, we think ideology, or let me put it, let me quote him differently. He says, ideology is like bad breath. It's always the others who have it. So, uh, you know, those of us who see ourselves as critical, as radical, um, very quickly fall into this trap of thinking we need to, you know, um, kind of make others conscious and aware about their blank spaces. And in that moment, we are not vigilant about our own bad breath. And we construct ourselves and stage ourselves and see ourselves as post-ideological. And I think it's extremely important. I think critique without self-critique is uh, a very lazy process. So I think it's very important to constantly be aware and to stay in the metaphor of our own bad breath. Let's stay with this idea uh, a bit, uh, this idea of collectivity and also working together and be in th uh, this constant criticism. Uh, Faye, you've also mentioned uh, the solidarity and uh, the necess necessity of forming coalitions and build community, uh, building communities. Um, Nikita, I remember your uh, quote from a previous uh, speech where you said, we might be in the same storm, uh, but we are definitely not in the same boat. So it's the very issue of intersectionality uh, that we tackle upon here. Um, so how can we build these coalitions while still taking account 
the huge amount and the different dimensions of inequalities that lie underneath it and, the, and that we are constantly confronted with. Um, so maybe, Nikita, from a theoretical point of view and then with your practical experience. I'll try and keep it short. I tend to talk very long. I make this joke constantly. When you get paid to talk, you can't stop talking. So I'll try and really uh, be disciplined. Um, so again, just two points very quickly. Um, we gave this workshop on intersectionality and we, of course, talked about uh, how, what an important um, the genealogy of intersectionality, the extremely important contribution that black feminists uh, have made in enriching not just feminist scholarship, but also activism with its concept of intersectionality. Um, another aspect that one could talk about when one is talking about intersectionality is the intersectionality of hate that's, that's, that we are experiencing. So how anti-Semitism, ra racism, sexism, heterosexism, transphobia, um, ableism, uh, and a lot of, I mean, again, this, you know, once you start itemizing, you come with et cetera. Um, so how these various forms of hate politics is coming uh, together, which makes um, alliance politics all the more imperative. And here, my little suggestion, my really humble and uh, perhaps also inadequate suggestion would be that um, we need to, uh, you know, kind of turn Marx on his head. So Marx turned Hegel on his head and said, you know, the philosophers have only interpreted the world um, I always have to say it in German, es kommt drauf an, die Welt zu verändern. It's important to change the world. Um, and uh, of course, that is significant. This is what also uh, my colleagues pointed out. But I would here argue, and that's why I say we need to turn uh, Marx on his head, we need to take a moment in order to change the world, also interpret it. So here I would bring in Gramsci in conversation with Marx. And Gramsci says, the group that is the slowest to emerge and develop are the intellectuals. All other groups, you know, are faster. So whether it's journalists, it's policy makers, it's uh, uh, social workers, uh, it's uh, politicians. But because thinking is such a slow, painstaking process, um, intellect, intellectuals are those that need a lot of time to emerge. And which is why I think um, um, it's such a challenge, the theory, practice, spannung, the tension between thinking and acting is so challenging, it's so complex and so frustrating for all of us. Um, and I think, so on the one hand, the importance of alliance politics, to somehow see how our affinities, our shared, shared vulnerabilities, our shared feminisms can bring us together, and yet take the time, be patient with yourself and others to see what to do with differences and how differences make a difference. Yeah. Hey, can you comment on this maybe with your particular experience, also coming back to the book that we've mentioned, the graphic novels, uh, movement and moment, movements and moments, uh, stories from indigenous people, mostly from the global south. What is your experience with solidarity in this collectivity and then also having the Goethe Institute uh, and German taxpayers' money coming in, you know, uh, giving this platform? So, first of all, thank you to the German taxpayers for <laughs> helping us print this really uh, wonderful book in, uh, actually in several languages, no? because uh, each of the countries also printed the, uh, a copy of their own comics. For example, us, we printed a, a Filipino version of the comics in the Philippines for Filipino readers. Um, so obviously, we're, uh, we're not um, part of the indigenous population in the Philippines, um, but we have the resources to, uh, to um, to, to create these comics, no? Me, uh, our, us, the press, and uh, the artist, Nina Martinez. So we made sure to work closely and um, consult with the community whose story it is that uh, is being told, whose story is being told. So we consult, there was a great, a huge deal of um, consultation, and um, we had to get their approval, we had to, et cetera. So it's just us, um, 
it's it's really still them telling their their story basically um and uh actually we the the byline in the comics no it's gantala press it's our uh, literary collective it's not my name or or it's not the name of the writers who wrote the the comics because r the process of writing was really um collective in this in the sense that uh, first of all, the story is shared. It's not only by a particular individual. It's a it's a story of a whole community of a whole of, of the Filipino people essentially. Um, and then second, um, after you know, it is the product also of consultations and several discussions uh, among different people. And then uh, after writing the story, we had it checked by uh, others for translation, uh, for, uh, for accuracy in translation, etc. So it's, it was really a collective uh, process. Uh, and it, um, it's a different uh, way of writing because we, we, we tend to think of writing as a very individual um, act. But uh, in, the, in, the, in these comics, um, the, the entire process of creating the, the comics uh, from, from discussing with our uh, peers and with Gethe and, um, and in the course of doing the research, you know, everything was uh, taken, into, taken into account. Joel, your experience with Jim, this multimedia platform in Arabic, you also very much rely on feminist solidarity, right? And working with different partners. So yeah, I mean, um, the thing with Jim is that we don't um, produce the knowledge ourselves in the sense that, that we're not the writers, except for like, it's maybe like 10 to 15% of the content that is done internally by the team. Um, we work with contributors from uh, across the Arabic region, but also in the diaspora. And they are the ones who are actually producing the content. We just provide the editorial support to be able to produce and the platform to, to publish. Um, and this is where um, the collaboration comes in because um, the way we, we see, we see the, the work on the content is that it's, it's not so much a top-down approach because we are the publisher. We have privileges, right? We can say no. We can uh, uh, impose certain things, but we try to do it differently in a sense that um, working with the different ideas and the pitches that come in, and supporting the the contributors who come from because we're multimedia. We work with different formats, so we have text, we have visuals, uh, we have visuals being uh, video or illustrations or photos, and we also have the audio. So we trust the contributors to come in with their ideas and we just provide the support to um, flesh it out in a way. Um, and most of the, the contributors that we work with aren't uh, professional writers or granted it requires some skills for the other uh, medium being you know illustration or but for the writers many of the contributors we work with they aren't professional writers so we try to support them with being able to communicate their ideas and the, the experiences that they're going through and the stories that they want to tell about their um, the lives and the communities that they're in um, and just being a support and sort of like a stepping board as opposed to um, imposing things from above because we are a publisher, because we are a media organization. Um, and that changes things. There's a lot of understanding that comes into it, right? Um, um, because we want to... It's, it's no longer very much focused on the productivity in a sense that... Uh, we do understand the context that every contributor is working with um, because we're also in a context that's a challenging context. So we try to provide, provide that support to be able to, to, to work together and to uh, get this knowledge out there. Um, and if I, if I may, I want to go back to that idea that you were talking about, about the, uh, the boat and we're, we're in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. I think what we can, what I try to remember and, and also what Nikita was saying about slowing down and, and thinking, I think I try to remember about the privileges that I have. And this is where the privileges can make us be in different boats. Um, so I try to think about the privileges that I have and how I can 
um, use my privileges to do good rather than to worsen um, things, to perpetuate certain violences, certain um, oppressive systems. And maybe this is also to think about our own privileges in our moment of taking this pause to reflect to, we don't always have to be doing something. And thinking actually is doing, right? We're always thinking I have to do something. And, and maybe this is also about a heightened sense of responsibility as feminists. We're, the world is plagued with so many issues that we keep feeling this responsibility that we have to do something. But it's okay to, to take a step back and take a pause and think about how we want to do these things and, and how our positionality may affect what might happen uh, and how we might do it. That's a, I think that's something very essential that we can all take with us um, to really reflect on a daily basis. Also in one of the videos before the festival was said, what is feminism? And it's a daily decision uh, and also a daily struggle. So really to reflect on these privileges and work on it. We will never be perfect and we can never solve all problems. But yeah, try to work with what we see and what we have at our hands. Yeah. Um, I'd, li I'd just like to add on... <clears throat> On, on that, um, like for in the Philippines, now I've uh, <clears throat> I've had some uh, young women uh, come up to me and ask, "Is it okay to um, to join you in your uh, activity um, in your protest activity for for peasant women, for example?" Uh, I am a I am a member of the middle class. I don't know anything about their issues. That's what they say, you know. So am I, is it okay for me to join? And uh, I, I, I always tell them that I also um, asked that question before to the peasant woman leader um, that, that, I, that I know. I've had the privilege of working with. And what she said is, was, um, as long as it's clear to you uh, who you're doing the work for, then uh, of course your participation and your contribution is very much welcome. And the, the, the people, the masses will understand that and will appreciate that, uh, that effort from you. So you shouldn't let your, um, your, your privileges, your, your perceived differences um, stop you from, from participating, uh, from, from acting also. Uh, on behalf of certain causes. Another thing that came up now several times is the issue of time. Um, Nikita, you talked about it, uh, thinking as a very painstaking process that really needs time. Um, Joel, you with GEM, I mean, you're also not focusing on the day-to-day -day politics and developments, but really investing in the people you work with, um, trying to bring things out. Uh, and at the same time, of course, um, we have, we live in times of multiple crises where we need very fast, uh, quick action. Uh, Feiyu also supported different projects that, um, where people react to uh, like neoliberal investments, to big energy companies. So that's not the moment where you can say like, okay, it's, we need time, we need to build our community, we need... Um, we need um, to continuity in our processes, but you need to act very fast. So how can we bridge this challenge? How can we bridge this gap that we need time, we need continuity, we need a slow pace also for people to be able to join in. And at the same time, there is a huge political pressure also because we want to change things now. So you managed, right? So with your initiative? Um, yeah, because I'm, I'm also a volunteer at the, the, I'm a member of the Rural Women Advocates, is what we call ourselves. Uh, so we help <clears throat> the, Amiha, the National Federation of Peasant Women in their campaigns and causes. That's why uh, we've had the chance to participate in several like protest um, activities. But um, to, to an answer your question about what, what can we do? I think uh, first we have to understand and appreciate uh, our political task. As long as I think our political task is clear, then uh, we'll, we'll soldier on. <laughs> and then uh, second, I think we should also allow ourselves to rest 
and to allow others to rest as well. Um, I have, I know, uh, I know many people who are guilty uh, of re rest, uh, who, are, who, who feel guilty when they feel the need to rest. So I think uh, it's important to rest, to recharge, you know, and uh, so that you, we have uh, strength to continue to do our work. Um, you know, that's a, that's a tough one, right? We were just talking about, you know, wanting to take time. Life doesn't stop, right? There's always something, something happening. Um, I don't know. I feel like on some level it's being um, hopeful that someone else will, like, because, you know, it's a cycle of life in a way. Um, if I'm not able to do something, maybe someone else will be doing something. And it's okay to just accept that I won't be able to be doing something. I know that I want to, but I can't now, and I need to rest so that I can later on. And this is an important thing to remember if, if we want to keep the space whereby things are happening. And sometimes it feels like it's a strategy by the systems, right? They're constant in, constantly hitting us with crisis after crisis after crisis. So we're always in like survival mode and we're always trying to fight and it's a stressor above a stressor, like stressor after stressor and then you can't do anything you, and you feel like you're paralyzed. And it's, it feels like it's a strategy somehow by, by the systems and the context that we live in. Um, um, and it shifts your focus because um, you end up um, not being able to, to do the thing that you want to do and you end up Somehow, um, if you don't manage it well, you can easily find yourself in a state of a burnout and this constant feel that I need to be doing something and I need to be doing something. Um, but I think it's okay to, to, to acknowledge that we can't do everything, that the world is a... Can I say shit? Sorry. <laughs> the world is a very bad place <laughs> to be in. Um, um, and if we want to sort of... Uh, change things, we're gonna have to do things at our own pace and maybe that's a way of sort of flipping the power balance in a way, even though it doesn't sound like it, but to give ourselves the time to regroup, to rethink, to, to rest. And this is also a way of fighting back because you're, you're doing this to, to find different ways of engagement because sometimes you end up being in a place where it's not working anymore and you can't keep doing the same things over and over again knowing that they're not working. So this is a chance also to think about different things that we might do. And it's okay to, to, to rest, it's okay to... It's the shitty place and <laughs> there's only so much that we can do but the hope is that with the things that we can do and the generation that's coming after us and the generation that's maybe uh, before us, some, someone somewhere is still doing something and that's fine, um, just to have this hope. Um, and I guess also to imagine that, um, you know, like Nikita was saying, I mean, imagination, we take it for granted, but imagination is a very powerful tool to think of and imagine a, a different place, a different world with different mechanisms and and ways of being uh, with ourselves and with each other. Um. So two of my favorite German words are Vergangenheitsbewältigung um, and Zukunftsfähigkeit. So um, to translate it loosely, Vergangenheitsbewältigung is coming to terms with the past and Zukunftsfähigkeit is future viability. And my first language is Hindi. And in Hindi, the word for yesterday is the same as the word for tomorrow, which is kal. So there's this uh, provocative quote by Salman Rushdie who says, for a people whose word for yesterday is the same as their word for tomorrow, they don't seem to have a firm grip on time. Um, I, however, would disagree with Salman Rushdie because I would argue that in order, and I'll, this is a term I keep bringing up again and again, in order to imagine post-colonial um, post queer feminist utopias, we need to somehow also engage in a serious manner with the legacies of the past. So in that sense, um, we need to constantly rethink our relationship to both temporality but also spatiality. I think it's a very, very, it's been a very important intervention by feminism to kind of um, reorient our understanding of public and private. 
So uh, one of the biggest achievements of uh, feminism was to deprivatize many of the issues, whether it was gender violence, whether it was the question of women's work. And uh, so this, this kind of deconstruction and reorientation in our understanding of speciality and temporality has been extremely important uh, contribution of feminism. Uh, just the other day, a student mentioned, uh, we were discussing uh, his bachelor arbeit. It just happens that the student's name is also Nikita. So Nikita <laughs> mentioned um, to me, um, he, he comes, his family comes from Ukraine. Um, um, I don't know if I should share this, but I will now do it. Um, um, and uh, mentioned to me uh, something that was also an eye-opening, uh, uh, this for me, piece of information, that uh, Mariupol is almost equidistant to Berlin um, as Aleppo. It's just, uh, I, and I looked it up. So Mariupol is about 1,600 miles and Aleppo is, no, Aleppo is 1,600 miles and Mariupol is 1,100 miles. And yet, throughout the current conflict, we've been talking or we hear constantly this rhetoric that, you know, Ukraine is, our, they are our neighbors, whereas the imagined geography is that Syria is far away. So this was just an example of spatiality, and I could give you many examples of temporality also, where our sense of time, we need to constantly also question our sense of time and our relationship, I'm repeating myself, temporality and spatiality. And one last thing, and I'm grateful to uh, uh, Maria who wrote her PhD on utopias for this insight. So it's interesting when you go to the etymology of the term utopias uh, in Greek, it's the good place, but it's also the space that doesn't exist. In that sense, you have to constantly imagine it. And uh, our sense of futurity in a certain way is always because you can only imagine that which in a certain sense you also know. Um, and here, I mean, I haven't given you a very uh, well thought out answer, but just want to repeat myself that uh, feminists have given us very, very important tools to engage with temporality and spatiality that we should make good use of. Yeah, thanks very much for bringing in this issue of archiving and also of preserving history to be able to actually develop an utopian vision for the future. I think this is something that also a lot of people who uh, participated here in the festival are working on to actually create archives of a feminist female uh, history, or then her story maybe. Uh, for you as well, um, in your uh, with Gantala La Press, with your publishing house, uh, you said that as a feminist publishing house for you, it's quite obvious um, to focus on the private, um, on the domestic, um, on these women's issues. Um, and Nikita was just saying uh, that feminist role in this is of course very big of bridging this gap of uh, um, public and private. Uh, you are focusing on these stories, yet it is often considered by then mainstream society to be women's literature or to be like in a certain corner and the majority or the male half of the population then allows itself to neglect this as feminist literature, uh, as um, women's literature, right? How do you deal with this? Is this a problem for you at all? Or how, what do you think about this? Um, in our small press, so we formed our small press in 2015 uh, in response then to the um, uh, lack, what we perceived as a lack of uh, women's representation in literature, etc., and culture. No? But uh, as we, we grew, no? as our political consciousness maybe uh, grew and deepened um, by, by uh, get, getting involved in, um, in social issues, uh, our, our um, regard and appreciation of literature has also expanded. Or changed so we're trying to um, expand the definition of literature so for us literature is not just poetry fiction essays no um, oral accounts of for example the of soldiers attacking your community in the middle of the night that's literature no? so protest songs is, uh, are literature and we're also trying to redefine and expand the meaning of a who a writer is or should be, 
can be. No? So for us, um, that's why we have books written by peasant women, women workers, indigenous, uh, written with indigenous women. No? So anyone can be a writer is uh, what we think. So I think um, because we ha we've also had the, uh, the, the chance or the opportunity to, um, to work with um, people's organizations, and because uh, it's the women from majority of the Philippine population who are writing these books, um, it, it's just natural that the content of these books uh, resonate with the rest of the population as well. So because uh, in the Philippines, now when you write about um, issues of peasant women, um, they, they automatically relate to the rest of the population because it's uh, uh, they, these are issues that are being um, uh, what you call this negotiated <laughs> um, by by not only that particular sector but 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 by others as well. So um, I think it ha it has not really been a, a problem. Um, fortunately for us, uh, we have male uh, or men. We have male um, buyers of our books, and uh, they, they appreciate their, uh, our work so much. And um, I, I'd just like to add that um, in the beginning, no, we wanted our, our press to be like all women. Um, we wanted to publish women's works only. That's wh what we still do, basically. But now we've come to realize that men are not the enemy. No? Patriarchy is not, uh, I mean, men are not the enemy, they, they, they are comrades in the struggle, they, are, they, they, they should stand with us, um, with the women in, 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 doing our, in doing our political task. And they also suffer from patriarchy, as we see again in uh, Ukraine, also now in this war situation again. Yeah. Thanks for giving this example of working also very specifically in the local context um, and working with the people. Joel, from your experience with GEEM as well, um, GEEM uh, started as a project also to create knowledge in Arabic, so to actually strengthen a language to talk about issues like gender, sex and sexuality. It is a project that works for the whole Arabic-speaking Arab region, but at the same time, of course, you have huge differences in the local context. You have diff di different yeah. uh, social political contexts, you have different dialects, you have different cultures. Um, how do you deal with this of being an Arabic uh, platform, but at the same time addressing these uh, specific local contexts? Yeah, I mean, um, so, uh, because, I mean, GIM is, is regional in a sense that it's a lot of countries and Arabic being the classical Arabic is the unifier. Um, it's the common denominator. And, and this, is, um, this is where it, it becomes for, for the region. But then when we go into the local context and the differences between each country and sometimes within each country, different areas and different regions, um, we em embrace the differences in a sense that, for example, the the... The, the dialects we do incorporate the dialects into um, the, the what we publish um, with an explanation because the dialects differ between each country and they may not be um, uh, so known. So we uh, we explain like certain sentences or certain um, phrases that are used. We explain them in the classical Arabic, but we do encourage um, uh, contributors to use their own dialect in, in expressing their, um, their experiences and sharing their, their stories. Um, when it comes to the, the local issues, I mean, this is where we're trying to... Um, we think a lot about positionality, about who is writing, who is speaking, and, and, and and, and to whom they are speaking. But if you, if you think about who is speaking, um, we all, we're always looking for the people to, to talk about their own experiences from their own context. Um, uh, so we try to encourage contributors to tell us a bit, to tell us more about what they are going through and they can reflect their own contexts uh, from their own experiences. Um, and without the story being tainted by other interferences. 
um, it's always a challenge because some people will relate to something they will not relate to something else, but the knowledge is there. And it's making an effort to really be able to follow what's going on in each country and to try to um, get those stories out there, um, to be able to um, keep talking about what is happening rather than um, just keep... You know, the, the voices can be silenced and they are silenced. There are stories that we wouldn't know of, we wouldn't hear of. And there's also the effect of colonialism, whereby we learned about the issues and, and how we speak. We, we talk about them in foreign languages, not our own languages. And this is where it was important for Jim to be doing it in Arabic, to be talking about gender and sex and sexuality in Arabic. Because if I use my own experiences, I learned all these things in either French or English. I don't know them in Arabic. And then when I started being um, exposed to them in Arabic, they they seemed so foreign, right? And I couldn't say them. And I still sometimes struggle to say them. I would prefer to use the French or the English word. Um, but now this is part of it, that uh, there are ways to talk about these things in our own language and not to feel shame about it. Um, and to sort of normalize using these terms in Arabic. Uh, and also the classical Arabic, right? Because you might get away with things with your colloquialism. You know, you might say certain things. Um, um, and it's also like embracing that colloquialism in the classical Arabic that we can play around with this. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's embracing this idea that you can play around with this different things. You don't have to work with the rigidity of, of what it is. You can break those, uh, those structures that are so rigid and can uh, introduce different things, different ways of, of going about writing and producing and, and talking about things and expressing things. I would like to come to one other aspect now when talking about what can we take out with us from this festival and what do we do when we uh, are in our daily lives again. A big part of it, of course, is also protesting, uh, demonstrating, uh, going on the streets um, to actually say that you are visible, that you are here, that you have rights that you ask for, um, and that there is a joint movement. Um, Amnesty International has just published its uh, yearly report, and we actually see a rise in uh, police suppression of demonstrations. Um, so a l more and more uh, peaceful dem demonstrations are being attacked, partly also due to the pandemic, but I mean, we feel that there is a huge suppression and also oppression from the state uh, in different cases, from Germany to uh, other parts of the world. Um, Joel, you come from Beirut, so we have seen the demonstrations, a huge uprising um, and a state not coping with this. Uh, I imagine in the Philippines it's uh, also similar. Um, and Nikita, I remember your talk um, uh, recently also uh, presenting these protest movements and also the importance of it. So what are your um, concerns or what, what would you advise these protesters um, to do to also actually uh, remain visible and to state uh, their uh, statements uh, out on the street or publicly? Wow. I wouldn't presume to be able to do, <laughs> to advise. Um, I mean, it's, uh, I think the, the, the thing that we can think about here is how difficult it's become uh, to be present in public spaces and to voice dissent. Um, uh, you know, we, we're seeing a huge wave of, like the counter wave of everything that's been done. Uh, like if, if we're thinking about, for example, the, the revolutions in the Arab countries, like from 2011 onwards, we're seeing the counter. And the, the, the more time goes by, the more repressive and oppressive uh, uh, the, the state is becoming. Um, uh, I, I mean, I would want to say that we keep on fighting, but I know that um, uh, yeah, w w with the recognition and, and the understanding and the acceptance that sometimes we will not be able to fight. Safety is a huge concern. Um, um, 
we, I mean, maybe one way to go about it is to think about um, where is this going in the sense that, uh, like, for, for example, the example of Lebanon, um, we kept on protest, protesting and insisting on getting into the parliament and getting into the parliament and getting into the parliament. But then it, come to, it came to a point where what is it going to mean to get into the parliament, right? Our system isn't our system isn't designed in that way where getting into the parliament is going to mean anything. Um, but the act of protest is a very powerful act, right? This, uh, uh, the being standing up to this huge Goliath and we're the little Davids everywhere. Um, I don't know. I mean, I would leave it to people to decide how they want to protest. And protest doesn't necessarily have to be with your body and physically putting your life uh, out there. The protest can be done in different ways. And I think this is where we can be strategic about it and thinking um, what is the best way to, to protest and to think about also um, an outcome that can come out of it. Because you know we're protesting because we want to try to get something out of it. So how can we get that something if the, the same way of protesting isn't getting us anywhere. So how can we think of, about, of, of different ways of protesting um, um, the systems of oppression that, that we live under? Um, we were just, I was just discussing this up with uh, my uh, co, co panelist yesterday now because she's from India and um, I was telling her that the farmers' protest, the recent farmers' protest in India is really admirable to me because uh, the farmers were able to get what, they, what they're demanding. And uh, it's, it's really very um, powerful if it's the, uh, the farmers and the workers of the world who unite <laughs> and um, break the chains of uh, no, capitalism and uh, uh, the, the power of whoever's in power. So we should remember that protest, um, protests brought the char of Russia down in 1917 and brought about a revolution. Uh, protest was what ousted the dictator in the Philippines in the 1970s. Uh, and um, people are, con pro protest is, that's actually the, the gist of our story, of our comics now, that protest uh, stopped the World Bank and Marcos from building this mega dam on the on the on their ancestral land, so it's very <clears throat> as Nikita already mentioned. It's important to look back at history because there are a lot of lessons to be learned uh, from from history. Um, at the same time, uh, it's also important to uh, it's it's also important to again stay educated, uh, be just uh, just um, launching educational discussions in protest um, areas and just understanding the issues deeper uh, so that we'll all have a reason to stay in the pro protest and and uh, just just stay until you know we get what we what we what we're protesting for or against um, just like the the Indian farmers were able to do I have a two-point response to your question, and um, it's going to be a bit of a long answer, so I'm warning you all because it's something that I'm working on, um, struggling with. So let me start with the story. So uh, Bob Jessup, who's a Marxist state theorist, shares this anecdote. He was on the way to a conference and realized the person sitting next to him was going to the same conference because he had the same program in his hand. So he said, let me, let me introduce myself. So he says, hello, my name is Bob Jessup, and I'm a state theorist, and we seem to be going to the same conference. And the other gentleman turned to him and said, my name is Nicholas Luhmann, and the state does not exist. Bob Jessup had introduced himself as a state theorist. So Bob Jessup says that, also der Staat existiert nicht. He said it in German. Uh, Nicholas Luhmann, for those of you all who might not know, is one of the most reputed, renowned German sociologists um, who's come up with this system theory. Um, and Bob Jessup talks about how irritated he was by this statement that the state does not exist. Does it mean that the state does not exist the way it should? 
or it's the Marxist project that the state should stop existing, yeah? That it, the anarchist utopia of, you know, uh, the workers overcoming the um, monster Frua. Nietzsche talks about the state as the coldest of all cold monsters. And uh, what uh, Je uh, Bob Jessup goes on to, which I won't summarize now and bore you all with, but he goes on to uh, warn us that we need to be very careful when we are talking about, because otherwise we are very nuanced when we are talking about protesters and feminisms and Marxisms and third world, um, uh, we're, 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 we're very sensitive to differences, but when it comes to the state, we tend to you know, demonize it and homogenize it. And uh, what uh, Bob Jessup says is that we need to be careful not to ontologize the state. Yeah? So this idea that the state is one homogeneous entity, or again, to use Nietzsche's metaphor of the coldest of all cold monsters. So I would juxtapose this with another concept that comes from the French philosopher Jacques Derrida, who uh, gives us this Greek notion of pharmakon, how something can be both poison, but also medicine, counter poison. And I think we need to, when I talk about reimagining and uh, re-envisioning, we need to also, we as feminists, need to reimagine our relationship to the state and what we understand. I mean, this is another very nice uh, uh, advice given by Jessup. He says, uh, the question that gives state theorists a sleepless night is, what is a state? And actually, the state does not exist. And a very good definition given by Foucault is it's a mobile effect of multiple governmentalities. It's a very academic uh, definition. We can forget it. But what he's trying to show is the inconsistencies, the contradictions. I mean, Faye very nicely said thank you to the German taxpayers. Thank you to the, I mean, we shouldn't forget Goethe Institute is part of the German state. It's a soft power of the German state. So we are all guests of the German state as we sit here. The German state in a certain way, ironically, is enabling uh, the possibility for us, our agency to a certain extent here, to also critique the German state. And these, this is the ambivalent double bind relationship that we have to the state. Um, that we, and we should be very careful to make a distinction between critiquing the state, which is imperative, which is extremely important, and not falling into the trap of state phobia, where we kind of, uh, I'm, I find anarchism very compelling. Yeah, I, Some of my best students in Frankfurt, I spent six years in Frankfurt, were my anarchist students. But I would always tell my German anarchist students who are very, you know, um, very sensitive to German history and critical of the state monopoly on violence, and um, we talked about police violence, and I would say, all very well, but you all have the German citizenship. You'll have papers, and the German state protects your right to critique it. Which doesn't mean that um, we fall into any kind of naive pro-statism. Please don't get me wrong. I'm just trying to show the complexities of what we understand when we talk about the state. One, one minute more, um, to focus on non-state actors, protesters. Again, a historical perspective. Um, one of the biggest export products of Europe, and particularly Germany, is the Enlightenment. The Germans are very, very proud of the Enlightenment. Uh, there's going to be soon the 300th uh, anniversary of Kant, and there are lots of plans uh, of celebrating Kant. Yeah, Kant was a racist, and he was also uh, apologist for colonialism, but he also said some good things. Um, now, when, now when Kant talks about the birth of Enlightenment, um, he talks about the coffee houses where bourgeois men came together and deliberated about the French Revolution and whether it was justified to use violence or was it not justified. Um, when we are talking about non-state spaces where we say democracy flourishes, where um, civil society emerged, uh, my question is, where did the coffee come from? Where did the sugar in the coffee come from? Where who financed the Enlightenment? And the same question goes even is relevant for us. When we Twitter with our you know, smartphones and our iPads and our laptops um, against capitalism, against imperialism, against our state, we have to think about the super exploitative conditions in which these 
electronic gadgets are produced that make our radical agency possible. So I'll end by saying Foucault tells us where there is power, there is resistance, and I would like to request you all to remember where there is resistance, there is power. And we have a very, very complex, we transnational elites, and again I'm interpolating a we in this room, have a very, very complex relationship to the state. Thank you, Nikita, for this long answer, but I think uh, with a lot of food for thought. I think that's the moment also to invite you to ask questions or to come in. Uh, those sitting here at Pfefferberg, but also those in the live stream. So uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will also get them here on stage. Are there any immediate questions? I'm afraid I don't see it, so can we have some? Ah, perfect. Any questions? Okay. If not, oh yeah, there is one. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask especially to Nikita. Uh, we talked about, you talked about the state phobia. Uh, I come from Bangladesh and there are many laws recently passed that we call draconian tools. And one of them is that, you know, when you put a status on Facebook that you're not feeling well, somehow it might be interpreted as if you do not like the government. So you can be, uh, you know, detained or something like that. So uh, one thing is that where is, I mean, considering everything, the existing system as it is now, how do we, as people, how do we, negotiate and how do we bargain with the state? I mean, how can we feel powerful again? Because the idea of state that it's the sovereignty of the people and then it is submitted, so there, is, there are bodies formed to protect the people and we can take away the pe people. These are all in theories, I understand. But then under this circumstances, how can we negotiate? Because we don't have you know, the guns and we, we don't want it. We want a civil way to you know, negotiate our way through so can we can feel powerful again. Uh, from, from your experience, if I ask for an advice, how do we make ourselves feel more powerful under such circumstances? Thank you. It's a very complex uh, question and I don't think I'll be able to do justice to it. So I'm just going to make an effort and I'm sure I'll fail, but uh, um, I'll, I'll still try. And... Uh, um, like I said, please bear with me. Um, I've, I've tried to answer this question because this is something I've been working on for a long time. So this is a question that I encounter uh, often. And then it's the Beckettian, uh, uh, try and fail better. So I'll try and fail better this time. Um, first of all, uh, so there are many, many levels at which I could answer your question. So first of all, what the concept of state phobia doesn't come from me. It's Foucault who talks about state phobia in his governmentality lectures and points out that state phobia um, is a particular mechanism of neoliberal governmentality. So he links state phobia to neoliberalism where there is a systematic dismantling of the state's responsibility towards its most vulnerable citizens. Yeah, so this is, um, and let me give you a concrete example. When Steve Bannon, who's considered to be the master behind, mind behind Trumpism, when he was asked what was, what was in his understanding Trumpism, the ideology of Trump, he said, and this, this is really painful, he said to deconstruct, he actually used the Deridian concept of deconstruction. So he said to deconstruct, and this was at the RNC, the uh, Republican uh, uh, National Conference. So he said to deconstruct the administrative state. Yeah? So this is a very systematic strategy of dismantling the enabling aspects of the state. So this is one clarification, the theoretical clarification. Um, I would not be arrogant enough to give you uh, or anybody in this room uh, suggestions of how to, you know, uh, uh, negotiate with the state or how to mitigate the pernicious and uh, violent and coercive uh, aspects of the state, um, I think one of the most important lessons of post-colonial uh, or feminism, global south feminism is 
to counter against universal solutions. So we need to tailor our strategies according to the context in which we work. But I will share with you a historical example in the hope that this might shed light and this might be helpful. So Timothy Snyder, who's a historian, gives the example of national socialism, um, of uh, fascism in Germany. And he goes back and analyzes once uh, uh, the, uh, the national socialists started expanding towards the east and starting take, taking over territory in Poland, in other uh, eastern parts of Europe, uh, what they did was they systematically destroyed the bureaucracy and the juridical functioning of institutions in these states. And the more they destroyed the bureaucracy, the easier it was for them to kill the Jews. So he gives a comparative example between Estonia, and there are many, many examples he gives in his book called Black Earth. Um, and uh, uh, he gives the example of Estonia and Denmark. And in Denmark, 99% of Jews who had Danish citizenship survived. Whereas in Estonia, the, um, the uh, I think, I, don't quote me on this, so I'm just giving you figures, but a majority of Jews were killed be not because the Estonians were more anti-Semitic than the Danish population, but because the bureaucracy was completely destroyed. And so he, uh, here he gives us a very counterintuitive example, and uh, Snyder here is drawing on Hannah Arendt and her insight into uh, origins of totalitarianism, where she talks about how the right, the very possibility to have rights is within, given that our geopolitical structures are organized um, in the form of nation states, um, we need to somehow take seriously this counterintuitive insight that bureaucracies and state institutions can sometimes save lives. And we need to rethink our relationship and our strategies of what to do with state institutions. Other. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Um, I'd, I'd just like to um, answer, try to answer also. Um, I think uh, the people hold the power. So when we feel powerless, we should remember it's us who put them in power. Well, at least in, in the democratic countries, that's how it, it was. No? So we put them in power, so we also have the power to take that um, position back. Uh, from, for example, we, we elected Marcos, but we also have the power to oust him. Um, so that, that's that's what I try. Uh, that's what I think when uh, when it all looks so depressing. Uh, in the Philippines now, it's very, very depressing, you know, because the son of the dictator is the pres presumptive next <laughs> president. So it's it's very depressing there now. I don't want to go back, actually. <laughs> No, just joking. Um, but also, uh, to add to um, protesting, as uh, Yoel said, there are, there are many forms of protest. And protest, going out on the streets is just one form of uh, resistance. So uh, it's important, I think, uh, for, for activists to also organize the people who are there in the streets. No? Organize them. Um, hold educational discussions with them, try to figure out what's happening with them, etc. So, uh, so that the, the movement is sustained. Yeah, I just wanted to also like somehow react maybe to this protest thing. Like, and I think it's very beautiful that you say like that we have the power to like change stuff, but how would you do it when you feel like maybe the power is like that it's not there or like, I mean, we have many examples all around the world where the protests are maybe not leading anywhere, are suppressed, we have dictatorship, we have like places where protest puts you in a danger. In a worse case, in a better case, it's that like, I don't know, like for example, in Poland, how 
the abortion rights were suppressed and how there was protest and nothing happened, how you can believe that it's still, like, or where to find this belief that you still can change stuff? I think, uh, yes, <laughs> I think we can, still be, we can still believe in the power of protest. Uh, we should also. Um, you mentioned Poland, but also in Argentina, it's the protest of the women there, the Green Wave movement, that um, I think uh, passed the law for abortion, ah, the allowing abortion. So, uh, it, it, I don't know, maybe let's just continue believing, I don't know. Um, and, and also maybe um, understanding also the um, objective reality also of specific countries and cultures. So like, I, I, of course I'm speaking uh, based on my experience in the Philippines, no? And um, now um, we, there, we are still, like there are many young, many young Filipinos in particular are protesting against the elect electoral results because we don't want Marcos Jr. to be our next president. No? So we, we, there's, there's this hope and there's, there's this disappointment that there's no people power yet, but there's this hope also because uh, sometimes th that's what you have left. <laughs> you, you can only hope you know, that, uh, that tomorrow there'll be people power, I think four, four people power, the fourth people power if ever that will oust this, uh, no, this president that we, we reject. So I, I can't really <laughs> advise, but I think we can believe in the power of protest and we should. I think part of, I mean, uh, I mean this is all related. To, I mean, in a way, it's, it's keeping the hope alive, right? And being strategic about how we protest. But uh, hopelessness is the is a tool of the systems that we live under, right? And no matter what you do, you will fail. We will, uh, you know, open our guns against you. We will put you in jail. We will do all of these things. Knowing that, you know, when the power comes from the people, it's us who are playing this game and we elect those officials and then those officials end up Anyway, you know, there's a, there's a whole system that we, depending on the countries and the systems that we operate in, but I think it, it just helps to remember this, to, that these could be tools of the system against us and we will not let them use them against us, right? There are different ways where we keep the hope, there are different ways where we keep imagining, like Nikita was saying, like imagining different things. Um, and again, like Nikita was also saying now, um, it's, not a, uh, it's not a universal thing, right? What works in Lebanon might not work in where you come from. It might not work in the Philippines. Yes, we will see what is happening. We will read about it. We'll try to learn from it. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's exactly the same. There are differences. And we will see how we work within these differences to make the change that will work um, that would work for, for our context, right? Like, for example, in Lebanon now, with the collapse, uh, the, like, it's a, it's, a, it's a major economic collapse. It's the World Bank said that, you know, in Lebanon, we have the third worst economic crisis ever in the world. Um, and all the talk now is about uh, uh, selling the everything that the state owns as a way of recovering, right? So, because we hate the state, we're blaming the state for where we are, yes, sell it. But then again, if you think about it, what the state owns is what the country owns, is what the people owns. And selling it means we're uh, condemning the future generations to nothingness, whereby the state is, and this is where we can negotiate, you know, what does the state do? Um, and our relationship with it, and it's it's being critical about it and thinking what might work and what might not work. Um, and the context differ, really, like differ so much from different countries and sometimes from different areas. Um, and we are in a, what is it called? The, the fight of information, right? We're fighting all this hate. We're fighting, um, 
uh, all of this discourse and the narratives that are saying that this is good for you when we know that this is not good for us. Um, you know, the Bannon and the Trumpism and that there's a counter discourse that is trying to show the different side, but then again, it's, it's who has the upper hand, who has more power, who has more access to resources, how are they using it and how you can counter them. And um, we can see how we can do it. It's, it's never going to be easy. We're the underdogs everywhere. <laughs> But we're trying to, 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 to stay present, to stay active, to still try to do things. Because um, we have the hope, right? We want to change the, the, the worlds we live in. Um, we're hoping for the better. Um, I mean, hope is, in many ways, a feminist tool as well, to hope. Um, um, and how do we use that hope in our struggles, in our fight against this? these systems of, of oppression that are very much, yani, they're intersecting, right? It's not just one, it's one going with another and another and another. We'd have time for one last question. Yeah, maybe up there, I think. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Um. Maybe we have had two questions, oh sorry, I saw the other hand raise. So maybe we take the two questions and then we have very, Quick answers, yeah. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, I don't have a question. I actually wanted to add something important. Um, Jewish people were not the only ones who got killed in the Second World War. Um, Romani people also got killed, and I think it's really important um, to mention that they were stateless, and we are still considered stateless. That's why it made it so easy for Nazis to kill my ancestors, because if you don't have documents, not a state, they can get away with it. There was one question up there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, hi. I have a comment and then a question, right? So <laughs> be patient. I'm going to try to be brief. Um, it's also about this uh, discussion about the state. I think that we should remember that indigenous communities and other nations have different uh, ways to organize our political life and that we should try to imagine our, our lives outside the state also. And I know it's not going to be easy and I know it's not going to be an instant victory, but we should insist also in that, in that way. Right, and my question is about um, a comment you, you 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 made. You say, and it's true that uh, our energy and our time are limited. That's true. We all know, <laughs> and that we have also to rest, to pause sometimes. So I would like you to uh, to to add more about this, about the political dimension of resting, of, of pausing, what is that important? I know it is, but I want you to hear your opinion about it. Thanks. Thank you. I was just told there was one other question that you said. I, I'm sorry, it's so difficult to see. So maybe, okay. So, sorry. Hello. First of all, uh, thank for your reflections. Uh, I believe that we are in a very uh, difficult moment in an, our world. Um, for this, it's very important the, the transnational character of feminism. So it is very important to be here sharing with us in a global dimension. Because uh, where I come from, from Uruguay, it's very difficult uh, to to take a conscience of the situation of Bangladesh or Filipinas or La India. So I'm very uh, grateful for that. And also I want to, I'm a very pessimistic, but now I want to be optimistic and share a, a, a paragraph uh, from Guattari that talk about a molecular revolution. revolution. So I believe that maybe uh, sometimes we don't have enough uh, answers for our questions. 
o Aventura de Sousa Santos sets that we live in a moment that, have, that we have um, a strong, a difficult questions and very easy uh, responses. So it's very difficult to, to inform the, the situation. So I, I, I want to, to, to share with us that it's very uh, short. Yes, I believe that there is a multiple people, a people of mutants, a people of potentialities that appears and disappears, that is embodied in social events, in literally events, in musical events. It is common for them to accuse me of being exaggerated, bestial, stupidly optimistic, of not seeing the misery of the people. I can see it, but I don't know, maybe it is delirious, but I think we are in a period of productivity, proliferation, creation, absolutely fabulous revolution from the point of view of the emergence of a people. It is the molecular revolution. It is not a slogan, a program. It is something that I feel that I live in something meetings, in some institutions, in the affections, and also through some reflection. So I feel this molecular revolution in this festival, and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Thank you. Thank you. We are running out of time, so maybe f final statements from the three of you, also coming back to the question of resting and what you want to give to the audience to take with um, them. Maybe I can just answer uh, Alejandro's question, and that will be my final statement. <laughs> um, I think more than uh, just resting as an individual, we have also to think of uh, caring for, uh, for co our comrades and uh, caring for like the concept of collective care. Uh, so I think um, caring is, uh, should not be limited to uh, oneself only. Um, I think allowing ourself, ourselves and others to rest um, demonstrates our trust of, uh, of our comrades that they'll continue the work if we pause. You know? And it also demonstrates their trust in us that we will continue the work after we have rested and recharged. So. Um, I think uh, it's very. We should we should look at care and collective care as uh, another feminist tool like hope. So uh, we shouldn't uh, be guilty uh, for feeling tired. No? We shouldn't feel, we shouldn't resent uh, ourselves or others for making us feel tired. No, that's 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 the work that we have to do. So, um, but all of this will uh, all of this. Um, depends on you know, how much we trust our comrades uh, and how much we, we also trust ourselves and how, how, how committed we are to do the work. No? And uh, we should recognize that, that uh, caring for ourselves uh, is um, a way of keeping ourselves strong. Uh, and uh, um, so that uh, we can, uh, no, we're, we're strong enough to, hold, to, to go out there again. That actually, it's, um, it's, it's a practical, you know, it's a practical act no, to care for ourselves. Uh, it's, it's a necessity. It's, it's as important as eating, sleeping, drinking, no? care, uh, resting. So. Um, I'd like to first thank the colleagues who uh, made the point about the uh, uh, Romas and Sintis and also the indigenous people. And again, to clarify that, of course, different contexts have different relationships to different institutions and different entities. So the point is not to universalize. Uh, we have to be very, very sensitive to the singularity of experiences of different groups. So uh, thank you so much for the interventions. I'd like to, uh, I don't think I can ever uh, give a talk or uh, uh, participate in an, a panel without drawing on Gayatri Spivak, so maybe I'll end with that. Um, and, and those of you all who've heard me before, Sorry for being repetitive, but I find it very, a very useful metaphor. So she says, doing politics is like brushing your teeth. All of us got up today in the morning and brushed our teeth, although none of us knows whether we'll survive the day. So actually, brushing your teeth is a pretty futile exercise. I know there are a lot of very young people in the audience, and I shouldn't be talking about mortality. But in a certain sense, if you reflect upon it, dental hygiene is a pretty and it's, it's a waste of time because really when you get up in the morning, there are no guarantees that you'll survive the day. And yet we do it three times a day. Painstaking, repetitive, without guarantees. In the hope 
that we'll turn 80 and still enjoy a baguette. And this is feminist politics of, you know, being optimistic, although there are no guarantees. So let's brush our teeth, although there are no guarantees that we will have democratic post-imperialist futures and in the hope that uh, we'll see each other, uh, we'll again be invited by the Goethe Institute. They'll play host again to us so that we can continue um, our subversive radical activities collectively. Thank you so much. I think we can end on Nikita's. I mean, I don't. <laughs> I mean, you asked, uh, Johanna, you asked, like, um, in, in terms of takeaways, I think I feel very lucky that I got to sit on this panel today and actually get to know more Nikita and, and Faye. Um, and this is also something that I'm taking, this learning experience of just being here and, and hearing you speak about your experiences um, and even the questions and the, uh, uh, the experiences that were shared from the audience taking that with me as knowing that I'm not alone, even though we're each in different places, but knowing that I'm not alone and um, we're all being political uh, in everything that we do. Um, so yeah, thank you. So great, thank you. We keep on brushing our teeth. I take your quote, it is a shitty situation and Faye, you in front of your text, you also write, you perceive your work as disaster response. So I think there is a lot of disaster, there is a lot of shit, but we brush our teeth. Thank you very much. Uh, Joel Hatem, Nikita Dawan, Faye Kura. And thank you to you for joining. It's called the closing talk, but it's not a closing. We still have an evening full of events. So there is performances, music, uh, talks, presentations. So please stay with us. Uh, there is still some hours to go. Thank you. Yeah.